When it comes to spectacle, Yutaka Nakamura is perhaps the top innovator and practitioner in the anime industry. Today, I'm going to focus down on one key principle that Nakamura uses to create outstandingly cinematic works of art, and one that we can learn from and apply in our own work. This principle is contrast. There are different ways one can use contrast, such as color, composition, shapes, direction, but two ways that Nakamura utilizes contrast to staggering effect are contrast of speed and contrast of scale. Hey guys, I've got quite a few clips lined up. I don't know how many we'll actually get through in the time. It might be that I just show you some of them and then the rest uh, that I don't have time for, I'll make into a Patreon video. The thing I want you to take away from this is how he uses contrast. We're looking at contrast of speed, proximity tension, which is a new little thing that I made up. You know, I like to make up all my own words. So this is the clip. So we have the figure and we have the ground and look at how fast the ground is traveling and then look how fast the figure is traveling. By comparison, the figure is actually just crawling by like very slowly and when you pair that with this ground which is rushing past creates some kind of dramatic appeal really nice so see if there are shots in your film where you can use that uh, it could be the other way around everyone else like literally in slow motion and then this guy just like whizzing through the crowd or something he's got some nice depth in here keeping in line with perspective it's not just completely flat it's not like a flat grid to us. It's actually going back in perspective. It's creating these little shapes as I go. Uh, sometimes I like to use sort of arrow shapes like this. And they're going into the distance. Proximity tension. Proximity tension is a word I came up with. It probably doesn't exist before this. But it's another effect that make, will make your shots really appealing. So there's this ground rushing past and then we've got the figure here. Uh, by the way, the figure is in this really, really nice uh, dynamic pose. I love that pose. It's so cool. If you look at his foot, his foot is like really, really close to the, the ground. There's probably about a centimetre or like an inch away from the ground and this ground is rushing past. That's what I'm calling proximity tension. You know, you've got to remember that everything in animation is deliberate because everything had to be drawn, everything had to be put there. So he chose to have the character that close to the ground. That to me creates this tension, which in an action scene, you're always looking for tension. You're always looking for, you know, getting things really up close to each other and um, creating excitement wherever you can, even in the small details of an image, really close to the ground, like he's skimming along the surface. Amazing, it's, um, it's really amazing, uh, his animation. Right, contrast of scale. So we, we looked at the contrast of speed, and how certain elements in the frame are going really slowly, certain elements are going really fast, and then you widen that gap to make it so that there is a, a high contrast in speed. You could do the same with scale. Now, if you were to draw a surfer surfing on a big wave, you might start with the surfer and, you know, you draw the surfboard, uh, I don't know, I <laughs> haven't studied any reference and I'm not a very good surfer so I know I would be struggling to stand up on the surfboard. You know that that's a pretty big wave. I certainly would say that if you actually go surfing a wave like that is terrifying and that looks like a pretty average wave. The waves feel really big when you're actually surfing. Anyway, that's uh, getting off the point. But what if you want to show people that this is a big wave that you're surfing? You can make the big the wave bigger in the frame, but it gets to a point where you can't actually fit it in. So the only thing you do then is uh, you make it big by comparison. So that's what he's done in this clip. I don't know if he's responsible for the storyboarding, but I would assume that he he was. 
this is very like his style. So here, the surfer, he's shrunk down the surfer to literally like a dot. We've zoomed the camera way, way out. We're seeing this little dot, which we know to be a surfer going along. And then, and then you can, you're able to fit in this massive wave. So by comparison, it looks absolutely enormous. Even though if you look at the screen space, this wave here, which it takes up that much space on the screen, they're kind of similar in the size. So that's the power of contrast of scale. And as well as getting across the fact that this wave is absolutely titanic, it also, again, contrast of scale makes it very appealing. Having things of different varying scales instead of everything being a sort of uniform size uh, relative to the camera. I think that scene uh, describes it very much and this is not by any means the only time he uses this technique. He uses this all the time and it's one of his staples and one of the things that makes his work uh, so vivid and like you're experiencing it. This shot from Space Dandy is absolutely insane. <laughs> Look at the contrast of scale he's made with the character versus the environment. The use of perspective to make the shots more dynamic, as well as the use of diagonal lines in the composition to make it more dynamic. We have more proximity tension as he hurtles right past this surface. And then we have his very famous effect, the Utipon Cubes effect. This is a, a, an effect that he helped to, to pioneer, really. It's a specific stylized form of debris where everything is in these cube-like forms, and he's one of the best at doing this. Now, I'm not gonna go into how he did this here because I've just created a course, as you should probably know if you follow my channel. We go through step-by-step step on how to create a Utapon cube debris effect just like this, the interaction between the dust and the cubes themselves, how you layer it, the kind of stages that go on before that, there's these anticipation stages. So I break down six different case studies that look at exactly how you do it, how it's been done before. So there are three live action references. There are three anime case studies, including one from Yutaka Nakamura. We actually work through our own scene of a Utapon cube debris scene. So you get to see step by step how you would make an animated piece like this. Now, I know that some people probably didn't get a chance to see the last video, weren't here or something, and now you're just watching this video for the first time. There was a sale that went on last weekend. I'm gonna put up the sale again for you so that you have a chance to get that um, opening day sale. So visit the link in the description. It's really, really affordable for a, for a course of this size in something this specific and this detailed. Do check it out. Uh, the link is in the description. Yeah, put a lot of work into it and I think it will really help you if you're serious about becoming an animator. Breaking the rules. Is this one uh, this is his work on concrete revolution which like i think concrete revolution is where he's done some of his best work you'll have probably seen this shot somewhere on some kind of inspirational sakuga collection i'm gonna look at how he breaks the rules uh his control of time like when things are ordered to happen so that you're able to focus on each thing uh contrast of speed as well he uses that again and also just his vast, vast repertoire of different animation techniques that he can choose and call on at any time. If you look at how many things this scene is built up of, it's just staggering. Let's have a look. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So first of all, we have this uh, we have this part where I've done this move on him, which means this robot is flipped upside down, and so he comes along and just fast. We get to see these very cool motion blurs, and I think that this technique, uh, where you basically see multiple versions of him, like you've got sort of one very rough version of him here, one slightly more formed version of him here, or extremely streaked, and then you've got him more formed here, and it's like coming out of the blood. That technique is called multiples. 
you learn about that if you learn the fundamentals of animation with like the animator survival kit or something like that. So he does these cool little circles around this character. Again, we've got closer up streaks now. It's really interesting to go through this frame by frame and see what the decisions were here. Uh, he, he really wastes no time for him going from there and going around to the other side. It's extremely fast, that movement, and then it slows down like in the next frame. The contrast in speed is not only between different elements of the frame, but it's also um, within the same character, he will go from being extremely fast, where you can barely see him, he's just a blur, to being extremely slow and smooth motion. So then we have probably the most impressive part of the whole piece of animation. He's using this kind of Wing Chun style Kung Fu on the character, rattling off loads of different punches. Now, if you had a scene where he's gonna be like this upside down and it's gonna be like gonna pass around this way, he's gonna be doing punches on him here and then he's gonna turn around, do more punches here until he gets over here. The only problem is that uh, you won't be able to see what he's doing because he'll be blocked by this guy, right? He'll be blocked by him because that, that's the rules. You can't see through people. Well, he just went and broke the rules. He's such an audacious badass that decided, uh, you know what? I will just make him temporarily transparent. <laughs> this guy, man, this guy. So that you can see all the lovely details of this Wing Chun that I've been wanting to draw. And then on the other side, I'll just uh, fade him back in so he's fully opaque again, like like normal characters. It's just, it's breaking the rules and I'm so glad he did it. It's, uh, it's amazing. The motion blurs, the timing and spacing, uh, using the motion blurs so that you can actually follow along with the punches and it doesn't just look because when you're dealing with very fast motion, if you don't use motion blurs, it can actually look very unnatural and very weird and it, I can't follow where the fists are going and stuff. But the punches are really nice. He even varies them. They're not even the same punches. Each frame is very different. He's got, he goes in for like a little uppercut there. It's not an uppercut, but like a low punch just to add in that nice variation. It's beautiful work. It's amazing. So we've got this really slow movement around, coupled with the extremely fast fists, like the fist work. I don't even know how many punches he does there, but it's it's a lot. <laughs> they get round to the other side, and he goes into this really, really nice uh, pose here. It's so cool. It looks straight out of uh, uh, Bruce Lee or something. Incredible. That's like a bit of anticipation, I suppose, before he does this last hit which is like, and then you get a, an impact frame. I'm gonna do a whole separate video on impact frames at some point, but this impact frame, it's just one frame, just one frame in there, and it just gives the whole hit a, a little bit of a punch to it, visually. Um, yeah, uh, he also fades out of the background, as you can see. Um, timing and spacing, again, like the character is right here with us, really large in the frame, the next frame he's very small, so that's very good uh, spacing, use of spacing to do that. He, now he's layering effects, he's got this white shockwave which literally is just pure white. Uh, you know how he likes contrast, well he's using pure white here which is like high contrast. Um, quite cool how it kind of divides into different rings and then cuts to where he's going to land this other character doesn't even waste time with having the character here, you know, uh, about to go into the wall. It's too fast for that. He just he just skips that and goes straight to the explosion because of how fast it is. Like a bullet, I suppose. He uses this white again to where everything is white apart from just these very faint shadows. Kind of reminds me of like a nuclear blast or something. You just see it very quickly go out to everywhere. And then there's this punch out. It's like the camera has almost like been blown away from it as well. 
subjective composition. Now, this is something that I want to experiment with a lot more. Uh, he's definitely inspired me here. So this is different to what I was showing you before. He almost like creates an abstract portrait of what is going on in the scene with uh, what he does. So, so here is uh, one of his subjective compositions that I pulled from one of his one of the animations. I can't remember which anime series this is from, so I'll, I'll try and subtitle which anime series. If I don't, if I struggle to find out, uh, could one of you who knows just post it in the comments and help me out. We've got this, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't watched the anime, machine like character of some kind. And then we've got this massive spike ball in the scene uh, and it's literally eclipsing the character. It's um, and it's just it's rolling towards him. Um, it's rolling in his direction. But this is abstract. This is it's not an accurate representation of where they are spatially or anything, but he's created it because that's what's important to the story. And it works amazingly well. He's a very audacious animator because I know a lot of animators who wouldn't have the confidence to make something like this uh, to, to actually do that because then they might be worried that it's not accurate to what's actually happening but Nakamura is like he's an artist isn't he we, we should also try and be like that we should be like artists this is now the other shot which is actually where they are spatially so you can see the difference here and even here like he's done certain things with the composition to just uh, he's framed it very nicely where we we're actually framed quite low um, we're framed underneath which is a nice angle we've got really nice uh, leading lines that are leading us to to the point you know all these buildings are also doing it um, and in this shot, he's sort of big in the frame and, and pointing towards... Uh, I suppose this hue is actually part of the environment, but still, it's, this would be like a, a 1000 millimeter lens or something. It'd be like hyper uh, telephoto lens. It's like super interesting how he does that. So this work is from Soul Eater. Close camera work and engagement with the audience. I love how he positions the camera and this is very common within anime by no means did he invent this method but he is able to use it extremely well and this is one of the those signature characteristics of the anime as a genre is that they they do this so so well if you imagine that you're actually filming this and you have like a virtual camera in the scene or that you're using a 3D software. You have a virtual camera in the scene which is moving around and there's actually a space. I think that's how they, how a lot of uh, Sakuga animators imagine their scenes. They imagine putting a camera in. I know I certainly do. Now look at how close up this camera, if it was a real camera, how close up it would have to be to these characters. I'll uh, just play it through this, these two shots. So those are two shots from Soul Eater, really nice little uh, pieces of animation. This is crazy, like whatever this foreground object is, it moves away. We'd have to be very close to his face there. And we're right in there, we've got like two, uh, three layers, sorry, you know, foreground, midground and background. We've got whatever this foreground object is, we're moving past that. We've got the main character in the midground, which is is like the main focus of the shot right now. And then we've got this rushing background. You get a chance to really look at his eyes, which are very powerful. It's, it's always very powerful to be engaged with the character's eyes. They're windows to the soul. And then that focus shifts as he goes out of frame. Uh, his focus shifts to the gun. We get really close to where we can literally almost look down the barrel of the gun as if the gun is shooting at us. Think about how engaging that is. There's a gun pointed in our face at this moment in the anime, like right up in our face. You can't grab our attention any more than like... So yeah, really cool shot. And then this one is amazing as well, how he's placed the camera literally in there with the action. This is what I always recommend people try if they're trying to make a very dynamic action scene. Put the camera right in there 
with what's happening. And then it kind of forces you to make these very dynamic, uh, to create this depth where it feels like things are literally coming out of the screen at you. Uh, remember, like pr our primal brains don't know that this is a film. Here's a bit of film theory for you. Uh, you I, I might as well throw this in there. There are two states of consciousness when you're watching a film. There's the state of consciousness, which is kind of sitting on the top, which is like, you know this is a film, you know it's a, it's make-believe. And then there's the more primal brain, which literally hears and sees stuff and thinks to itself, oh my God, this is real life. This is actually happening. So your primal brain is like engaged with this as well. Even if you are fully aware as you're watching it, that it is, this one will still be working. So creating that interaction where it's coming out of the screen just helps to to engage that uh, that primal feeling of you being in there in the action. The camera is literally right where she's about to step. So we get to see her face, this, the leading lines it creates, the single perspective. You've got a bit of Dutch tilt in there just to make things off kilter and and to stop the twinning effect. Twinning is when everything's really symmetrical and it looks kind of dead and boring. Uh, instead, it's like, it's off to the side. Gets a chance to, to use the, the nice motion blurs, which look really cool. Really nice. Uh, she's got her head like really down. Uh, she's literally charging at us. I don't know what could be more engaging than that, really. it's. Uh, it's fantastic. So if you're gonna do a scene like this, I mean, it might not be my style exactly, but if you're gonna create a scene like this, you might as well dial it up to like a hundred. So he's very good at doing that. The fact that he uses multiple effects, effects that he's helped to pioneer. It's also got this incredible control of uh, timing and spacing and everything. It all comes together to just make a magnificent show of effects. So there's going to be extra Patreon content for people who are uh, supporting me on Patreon. Thank you very much. And of course, I want to shout out again, the Sakuga Debris course is my first online course. So I've put loads and loads of work into it. I've put a ton of value into there just to look at how destruction scenes in anime, some of the techniques you can use to create your own destruction scenes. So. It's an absolute bargain for what you get. Please check it out. Subscribe if you want to see the next uh, breakdown of Nakamura or any of the other animators I'm going to be covering. There's a playlist also down in the description. That's the playlist where I break down other animators, other really significant animators. So you can watch that as a playlist. And I, I highly recommend you do. There's some great animators that I've already covered. All right. See you in the next video. Goodbye. It's time for a recap of the Animator Guild animation challenge of the month. This month it was a dance battle. I know I've been late to report on it. Congratulations to Road Sign for winning uh, this month. Made quite a funny little animation with a lot of dad jokes in there. Uh, Amberly, well done. Really nice piece of animation, well done. And Kenzie Quinn, I was very interested in it. I thought the music choice was uh, really different from all the others. It was a, it was quite an ambitious piece and quite interesting to watch and I, I liked it very much. So well done Kenzie Quinn. And Wolf, Wolf also made a piece of animation for it, so uh, well done. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you wanna get involved, in these animation challenges, but possibly get featured on this channel. You've got to join the Animator Guild Discord group. I will leave a link to that in the description. Uh, it's good fun, it's a nice little community, and it's very laid back, very relaxed. And we all learn a lot from uh, sharing our animations on there. So check it out if you're interested.